Hello and welcome to the Pregnant Pause panel. Um, I'm Zoanne Clack. I'm one of the co-chairs of Hollywood Health and Society. <laughs> Lovely. I did not expect that. Um, and I am also creeping down from a board meeting, from a WGA board meeting right now. I'm one of the board members, so I just wanted to do a quick intro to this wonderful panel. I recognize a couple of faces from the last panel that we did, which was talking about um, women's reproductive rights and women's health in general. And who else? Who was all in that at that panel? I recognize this is like a part two <laughs> of that panel, and we had some really interesting discussions that I'm sure that many of you will be so sad that you missed um, on just women's rights and um, from different writers. We had Glow, the, somebody from the show Glow. We had me as moderator from Grey's Anatomy. We had um, Orange is the New Black and some, some great people from Planned Parenthood. And anyway, we have some fantastic panelists here also to talk to us um, about some of the same topics and about being pregnant, and whether you want to have your character or yourself, this can be a self-help thing. <laughs> we won't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> whether you want your character to be pregnant, what are your options for keeping them pregnant or not having them be pregnant? And I think that this is a really timely issue because I always, as a person that uh, had their kids in their 40s, um, <laughs> always struggle with people who on television go, yeah, we're gonna solve this problem by getting pregnant. Boom, I'm pregnant. I had no problem with, boom, I have a baby, they're perfect. There are other options, people. <laughs> and of course, the, the classic, oh, I'm pregnant, but I don't want to be, oh, miscarriage. <laughs> so we are in an enlightened time. We have some enlightened new views that we can put out there. And this is a panel to address some of those issues. So, um, and of course, everyone knows about Hollywood Health and Society and how wonderful they are as a source of um, these kinds of panels and experts. And if you have questions about other medical issues or social issues, you can always call up Kate and the gang over at Hollywood Health and Society and they will help you immensely. Believe me, 14 years of Grey's Anatomy has shown me how important they are. And Grey's Anatomy has been on, been on for 14 years because of Hollywood Health and Society. Oh, and Shonda. <laughs> A little bit of that too. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kate Fulb and um, hope the panel is very wonderful for all of you and you all get wonderful things out of it. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Wow. Yay. Um, well, thanks, Oanne. There she goes. She's got a board meeting upstairs. She's coming back down in a minute. Um, and welcome everybody, this is great. You all look fabulous. Um, but we're gonna get right to it because we have tons to talk about tonight. Um, I wanna just give a quick special thanks and shout out to the Hollywood Health and Society staff whose talent and enthusiasm is the secret sauce to all of our success and all of our events. So thank you to the Hollywood Health and Society staff. You guys can stand up or wave or whatever. And also to thank our funding partners, um, some of whom are here in the evening, in amongst you tonight. You'll have to figure out who they are. Um, so I just want to get right to the topic. Uh, with healthcare in jeopardy uh, and in the news quite a bit these days, particularly women's healthcare, um, tonight's discussion is pretty timely. Um, as Zoanne said, there was a discussion about 10 days ago here in this room, and this is kind of continuing on that theme. Um, you know, on Saturday, Nicholas Kristof, some of you guys might have seen this, uh, Nicholas Kristof wrote in the New York Times a title, uh, a, the title of his topic was, um, If Americans Love Moms, Why Do We Let Them Die? It was in New York Times on um, Saturday, and uh, it's really pretty poignant, but one of the things he, he's referring to, obviously, is the high maternal mortality rate that we have in the U.S. compared to other Western countries. I mean, who would have thought, right? We have this crazy uh, maternal mortality rate. American women, an American woman, he says, is about five times as likely to die in pregnancy or childbirth as a British woman. And in Texas, 
a woman in Texas is about 10 times likely to die from pregnancy as one in Spain or in Sweden. Like, what the heck? You know? What? I mean, so this is one of the topics that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, also, a recent analysis by the CDC Foundation found that nearly 60% of American women who die in childbirth could have been prevented. Um, the C-section rate in the U.S. has risen dramatically from 5% in 1970 to about one in three births today. The debate around abortion continues, uh, and storylines on the topic are still very few and far between. And how does mental health figure into all of this? So these are some of the topics we're going to talk about tonight, and things that you think you knew about pregnancy, childbirth, and even abortion, you may come to understand um, they're a little bit different. Um, so, so here's how we're going to do this tonight. Uh, I'm going to show a short video montage, um, and after which we're going to have our first panel on childbirth come up for about 30 minutes. So our panelists that are on panel number one are going to come up and join me, um, and we'll talk for about 30 minutes. Um, and then I'm going to ask that panel to sit down and then our panel number two will come up and sit, we'll add chairs if need be. Um, and we'll do another 30 minutes with that panel. And then I'm going to ask panel number one to come back up and we have additional chairs. So we'll have everybody up here and we can do a Q&A with the audience for about 10, 15 minutes. And then, if you haven't had your fill by then, we're going to adjourn to the lobby or the whatever that room is, the reception room, for lots of food and drink. and our panelists will be at a designated little high top table and you'll be able to go up and ask them if you didn't get your question answered in the Q&A, you'll be able to talk to them personally about things. Um, there are a few doctors here, so you know, if you have that rash, you know, you can always <laughs> ask them about that. Um, and, uh, and we'll have food and drink and you can carry on. And Willie's also gonna, Willie Parker will be signing his book, selling and signing his book. And we have a VR experience by uh, Planned Parenthood in the, at the far end. So there's all kinds of fun stuff to do. Um, and if anybody's tweeting, uh, we're using the hashtag pregnant pause. So please tweet away. We're also uh, live streaming on Facebook tonight. So hi, everybody in Facebook land, although I don't think you're going to start streaming until after we show the video. Um, OK, so without further ado, let's take a look at some of the clips from shows that have dealt with some of these topics that we're talking about tonight. And disclaimer, there's uh, some colorful language and a little bit of nudity. So you know, just be prepared. OK, I'm going to start with um, Dr. Diana Ramos. Um, you're an OBGYN. Um, the last clip we just saw uh, talks about the over-medicalization of childbirth in America. And um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what Lisa Ling was getting at. It used to be that births used to be at home, not outside of the hospital. But I think what's happening is that we've got a combination of things going on. Women are waiting longer to have a baby. and because of that, there's oftentimes, and you had a great montage of video clips there, there's more complications as you get older. So um, there's a give and take. And we here in the United States have an amazing ability to actually um, intervene when necessary. And I think that's the critical piece to really highlight, is that when it's necessary, then that's when we have the option to intervene. And I think as the, um, the uh, Hollywood Health and Society, you are an amazing group to actually educate the public on the risk for the various uh, complications that can occur um, in healthcare and having a baby. But more importantly, you have the voice to be able to uh, make women aware that you don't have to do what is being uh, recommended or suggested to you. You can ask the questions and based upon an informed decision, then decide what you want to do. So, okay, let me get more specific. So, you're saying everybody really has a, a variety of options, whether to have the baby in the hospital, whether to have a midwife, whether to have a doula and be at home, <clears throat> or some combination thereof. Are there certain health situations, extenuating circumstances that 
um, determine one or another? For example, if a mother is HIV positive, is it better to have a C-section or better to have a vaginal birth? Or are there things like that that come into play? So in general, there is no black and white in medicine. I wish there was. <laughs> Otherwise, it would make our job a lot, lot easier. Uh, but in general, for a woman who is HIV positive, if she, depending upon the viral load that she has, the recommendation may be to do a C-section. But that's going to be based upon the discussion with the patient, based upon the discussion with um, their healthcare provider. But you know, I just want to bring to light um, an example of a patient that I just saw a few weeks ago. African-American uh, woman, 36 years old, previous C-section times three, and she now had preeclampsia. I mean, the, that video montage you showed was fantastic. And she really was the, the great example of, of what was happening um, and the differences in healthcare and the decisions that we have to make. And so she ended up having a C-section at 37 weeks because she had an unintended pregnancy. And this was something that goes on with the, the abortion portion of your, the panel um, because we know that unintended pregnancies occur over one in two births on average in the United States is unplanned. And it's actually higher among women of color. So, um, so this was an African-American mom now getting ready for her fourth C-section and preeclampsia. Uh, she also was uh, morbidly obese with a BMI of 44, really high risk, you know, the most complicated case that you can probably set up for. And the baby came out fine, but the baby had difficulty breathing. So this goes back to the education and really emphasizing that we don't want to unless medically necessary, and it was in this case, deliver a baby before 39 weeks because you can have complications. So even though this baby was 37 and a half weeks, she had difficulty breathing and had to be intubated. So, you know, it's... And so uh, you had to do the C-section because of the preeclampsia, so you had pre to go in early, you couldn't and wait. And she had her last pregnancy 13 months prior with a previous C-section. It was an unplanned pregnancy. So, you know, I think it's wonderful that you highlight this you know, in the video montage because we know that patients listen typically the most to their healthcare provider, then their friends, the family, and then you, the media. So to be able to educate the public with the key health messages, really highlighting the differences in ethnicity, I think, you know, you are a great partner. So thank you for, for doing that. Media is the great partner. You guys, you guys. Okay, so let's go to maternal mortality. So I mentioned that, you know, I'd read this article, and there's been a few actually of late about this crazy maternal mortality rate that we have in this country that I had no idea about. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, maternal mortality really is a call to action. And I'm happy to say that here in California, we have stepped up to that action. Through the California Maternal Care Quality Collaborative, we actually have a lower maternal mortality rate in California compared to the rest of the country. So nationally, the, the average maternal mortality rate is 10 per 100,000 uh, births in white women. For African American births, generally, it's 40 per 100,000. In California, we are 7 per 100,000 deaths maternal for white women. And for African American, we're 26 per 100,000. Still better than the 40, but we still have a lot, to, a lot of work to do. So yes, um, we actually here in California have been seen as an example of, of good work that can be done. And the only way that we've been able to do this has been collaboratively by working with the community, by working with the providers, with uh, policy to really make it an issue and implement uh, changes. So what, what's the cause? Why, why does this happen? Um, multifactorial. And one of the most common reasons is that, again, women are waiting longer. Um, we're just doing a maternal mortality review here in Los Angeles County. And sadly, I, I, and it was a call to action for me to realize that a lot of the moms that we were looking at were 35 and over. And I know whenever we see the diagnosis, elderly multigravid, you think, wow, elderly at 35, right? That's what, that's what you're diagnosed as if you're 35 and older. But that increases your risk for preeclampsia, for heart disease, for hemorrhage, for complications 
that if you need to be induced really um, can set you up for a failed induction, a C-section, and just uh, you know, a, a lot more complications, and that leads to maternal mortality. Depending upon where a baby is born in California, um, the really the C-section rate can vary from 7% to 70%. So it really depends upon the hospital, the skills, the capability. And so this is where I think all of you can really highlight that uh, when you're writing, when you're developing some communication pieces to say, look, make sure that you know what the C-section rate is in your hospital and that they have the capacity to take care of your baby in the event that your baby is born early. Um, this, I think it was last week, yes, uh, Yelp is now actually um, putting on their Yelp scores the uh, C-section rate of hospitals. So this is a powerful tool to really have the public make an informed decision to say, I'm not going to deliver at that hospital or think twice because that C-section rate is high. Wow. Okay. And last, lastly, well, and there's tons to talk about here, but this is the last one on my questions, and then we're going to move ahead a little bit. But so we saw on Jane the Virgin um, uh, the postpartum depression storyline. Um, and is, have we seen an uptick in that in this country, or is it just people are reporting it more, or sort of can you give us kind of the landscape of that? It's a combination of both. I think we are now talking about it more, and if we're talking about it, we're screening as providers. We're now actually screening our patients, and many times what ended up happening is that even if we screened and the mom had depression, we didn't know where to send them as providers. So you didn't, you're not doing them a favor by making a diagnosis and not being able to help. The thing that we have to realize is that one in five women nationwide uh, have postpartum depression. And again, unfortunately, there's a disparity in ethnicities, and that rate is about 27% um, of, of African American moms. So it goes from 20 to 27% of African American moms have depression. So you've got to realize that um, there's genetic predisposition. A lot of, um, if there's lack of social support, just hormonal is are what some of the biggest risk factors. 80% of all moms. We all get the baby blues when you have a baby, but you have to be able to recognize and realize, I can actually pull out of it. But when those moms persistently have those depressive symptoms, they don't want to do their routine care. I mean, that mom who didn't want to hold the twins, you know, was a good example. Okay. All right, we're going to move on, but we're going to get back. So Shadman, you're a midwife. Yes, I'm a nurse midwife. Hi, everyone. Um, nurse midwife, okay. Um, and this is something that midwives are seem to be, from my understanding, pretty common in other parts of the Western world. In Europe, it's something like 70% of the births are attended by a midwife. In the U.S., it's like 0.0%. I don't know. I mean, it's a very small percentage, slightly growing. It's slightly growing. I think across the U.S., the percentage of births attended by nurse, by midwives, both in hospital and out of hospital births, at about 3% now. It has increased, yes. It's increased to 3%. It has increased <laughs> to just about 3%, I believe, yes. And is there... Um, I mean, in no, I know in other countries there's no OBGYN anywhere near. There's just the nurse midwife. Is that the case here in, with deliveries that you do, or do you have a doctor also? Well, uh, the practice... Uh, the Tell UC us a little bit about how, how you work. <laughs> the practice at UCLA is, is unique in the, met in the LA metro area, unfortunately. Uh, we are a full scope nurse midwifery program within the UCLA OBGYN um, practice. Uh, we are about five full time nurse midwives. We have our own private clients, families that are looking to um, have nurse midwives take care of them during the nine months and attend their births, find us, finally get to us. Um, and we attend their births at UCLA Ronald Reagan Hospital. We work collaboratively with the UCLA OBGYNs, 
there is always at at um, in labor and delivery at, at UCLA Ronald Reagan there is always a nurse midwife present and an obstetrician present an OBGYN present and they also the OBGYNs also practice collaboratively as as a group so it is not a private practice for each uh, obstetrician they are there on a 12-hour shift or a 24-hour shift they are not going home after delivery they are there to attend to everyone that comes into labor and delivery that's a difference that's a big difference uh, on how generally uh, OBGYNs work in this country. Um, so that's why, um, anyway, that's why the C-section rate is very low at UCLA, Ronald Reagan, at UCLA practice. But no, if everything is, with, is normal, we are the only ones um, in the room attending the birth of, of our clients. Uh, we are also responsible for educating the next generation of obstetricians, so we always um, have uh, one of the residents, one of the OBGYN residents with us, so they can see a birth that's unmedicated with minimal intervention on a birthing stool or squatting on the floor or attending them, um, hopefully not giving birth in the shower, but sometimes it happens. Um, so yes, uh, nurse midwives uh, are independent practitioners but work collaboratively with obstetricians. And I just read this, and I think it was in the, the story about the maternal mortality, that in this country, we pay a lot of attention to the baby. When the baby's born, everybody rushes to make sure that the baby's okay, and you know if it needs to go to the NICU or whatever, everybody's running around, and nobody sort of, they just figure the mom you know, she'll be fine. <laughs> and is is does the nurse midwife kind of bridge that as well to kind of, in a, in addition to taking care of the baby, sort of making sure mom's okay? Yes, yes. In a in a hospital birth, um, there are other other um, healthcare providers there. There are nurses um, that also support the mom and baby and and the the partner. Um, they are all in the in the birth room. The midwife is uh, usually how it happens is the the baby comes out. The woman pushes her baby out. The baby comes up to her chest. You, if she is squatting, um, then the baby comes up. We we hand the baby. We hand the baby <laughs> through her. her. <laughs> we hand the baby. I'll be the baby. <laughs> And if she's squatting on the on the side of the bed, we hand she's pushing her baby out, right? And we're sitting behind her on the floor. So we hand baby up through her leg and baby comes up to her chest and that's it. Then we help her sit maybe on the bed, we help her push the placenta out. Everyone these days wants the cord, the uh, umbilical cord to stop pulsing before we touch it, which is great. It, the midwives have been um, advocating for that for, you know, decades. Uh, so finally, it's, it's normal practice to wait for that core to stop pulsing or slow its pulsation. Then the, then the dad clamps or cuts the cord. And as we're doing all this, we're welcoming baby into the world. We're looking to make mom is doing well. They're all crying. Everyone is crying <laughs> joyously. And, and the baby, by the first couple of hours, is crawling up to the nipple. And those cu first couple of hours, that's the goal, to make sure mom is not bleeding, the placenta comes out normally, baby is breastfeeding. <laughs> Sounds so simple. <laughs> okay, so tell me, uh, how do the dads, I mean, how do the fathers deal with this? I mean, I'll ask you first and then I'm going to go to a dad, but, uh, you know, I have a friend who, um, she might be watching on Facebook, uh, who had her second child at home, you know, and her husband is, he's a good old boy, you know, he's a, he's a bro. You know, every time I've seen him, he's got a jersey of his sports team. You know, he's that guy. So he was 
really nervous about having this child at home. And they had had one before that they had to go to the hospital for, so but she insisted on this. So it was really about getting him comfortable with having this alternative, what we consider in this country, an alternative birth. So, I mean, you're in a hospital, but still, I mean, do you have, do dads freak out? Do they, are they, un, do they want more, like the guy in the, with the woman in the bathtub who was like freaking out about modern medicine? I mean, do you see that? <laughs> Maybe not quite that crazy, hopefully, but. <laughs> no, there are, there are um, couples that come to us because uh, we are, the midwives in a hospital setting are sort of a compromise between the two. The woman probably came from a family, she, she was birthed at home, um, so she wants the same experience as her mother had. She wants to stay home and give birth, but this, this husband, this partner, um, is scared, so they have a compromise and come to the midwives at UCLA. So it's so they see midwives, but it's a hospital uh, location. But a lot of families, a lot of dads look for childbirth preparation classes. They do um, practices to help or be doulas, be doulas for their for their partner. Um, some some guys need to sit down because they're pale and they're, we notice them. I've started really looking at dads very carefully as the woman is pushing. I look at her and the dad and so it happens, it happens, but very rarely. Mostly it's, oh my God, some want to touch baby's head as baby's crowning. They ask us during prenatal care, can I be involved? Can I deliver my baby? And we say, sure, as long as, you know, everything is okay and baby's coming out, you can put your hand on baby's head. So yeah, you know, it really is all kinds of, all kinds of ways. Do you There's have a particular patient or client story you would like to share with us? Um, a, 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 an amalgamation of it's okay. exactly not this, but that, yeah, it happened. It's the, the especially second, third babies. Dads are more comfortable. The woman is more comfortable. Babies come out much faster. There is there is le less complication, and so yeah, the dad comes and is sort of the doula or the mom is at the woman's head or with the woman if she's squatting, and the dad is with us and. You know, helping the birth, you know, attend the, the birth of her, of his, of his um, child. Um, sometimes they're just shouting and crying and <laughs> and laughing and amazed all at the same time. Okay, Justin, <laughs> you got we got a guy here who he's got a real life story to share with us. You guys have your bio sheet, so you know who Justin also is. Also probably the most fertile man on television. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I was going to ask you how, I know the season one kind of paralleled a little bit, not not. Yeah, and then I went in my break and I did a couple episodes of Madam Secretary, and when I left, they made the character that I was dating pregnant from me. <laughs> and then of course my wife's pregnant, so in, so in two years I think I've had five or six babies. <laughs> Get around, dude. <laughs> okay, now we're all embarrassed. Um, okay, so tell me, so tell us about your personal experience. Oh man, I have so, so much to say about this as a as a man. I think there's just this generalization that men, um, the bros, are you know afraid and, but, but to a certain extent it's true. I mean, a lot of the men I know whose wives want to have home births are are afraid. And they end up in a place like yours because it's like the it's the compromise, you know. It's okay. Well, if something happens, then I'm I'm a thirty seconds away from a doctor, um, or, the or yeah, or the midwife. But to the men, you know, they they're like doctor, doctor. I need you know. I know guys that talked about having an ambulance out of their like waiting, like they paid for an ambulance to wait outside of the house just in case. Um, which, I, which again, and it's so funny because as men, it's like, it's it's her, it's it's their body. <laughs> like, what am I gonna to dictate how that happens? I mean, but leave it well, to men, right? Well, I was right? gonna say they um, dictate a lot about what happens, but we won't this get into This is the we'll problem. This is also the next panel. <laughs> so, um, so look. So at, at first, I, uh, you know, I was a, 
I was a C-section. Um, my mom wanted so badly to deliver me naturally. And after 36 hours, and again, it was in the hospital in the 80s, early 80s, there was no, there was no midwife. You don't talk about midwives and home birth. Like, and she was a hippie here in Santa Monica. So if anyone would have known about it, it would have been her. And, um, and I think to this day, she still has sore feelings about the fact that I had to be a C-section. Um, and I can, I can feel that from her sometimes. Say, does she treat you differently or something? From the other no, side? I can just, there's just something. I can feel it, like, you know, because she talks about how hard she tried and I just wasn't coming, and that's okay. And um, so all I knew was that, you know, as, as, as men, we're not really educated on, you know, what happens when our wives, you know, become pregnant. Like, it's just really because we see it on TV, you go to the hospital. Right? You saw it on ER, you see it in Grey's Anatomy, you see it, you just go to the hospital. And then you expect it to be a, ah, and then the baby comes. Or there's something wrong. And immediately you see, like, the second the baby's born, it's rushed away, there's things beeping, and this happening, and this happening, and then it's like, oh, and then the dad is there in his scrubs, and he cuts the cord, and then, you know, eventually, then the baby's, yeah, and then he faints or something. It's like all the stuff we've ever seen. And so when my wife got pregnant, I didn't even think about, a home birth option until she brought it up. And my wife is really intuitive and she's really in touch with her body. And um, that's what she wanted. So I just did some research and we watched a documentary about it. And then I got fascinated and I became angry. And I was like, how did I not know about this? And why don't men know about this? And so then we became home birth advocates to all our friends. And since we had our first baby, I think five or six of our friends have then gone on to have home births that we're gonna have um, hospital births, all from the same midwife who we're keeping employed. Um, <laughs> because it was, it was one of the most beautiful, spiritual, safe, calm experiences ever. And it took my wife 35 hours. And she did it completely naturally, without drugs, in our home, with music playing, with like the candles she wanted, with a midwife and a doula and the midwife's assistant when the time came, but for the first almost 30 hours, it's just her and I. And in real labor, in like some serious labor, and with prayers and with music, and, and I, it's the complete opposite of anything as a man and as a, as, a, as a television viewer or movie viewer I'd ever seen. Um, and again, and I read about all these quotes, or these facts about how we have the highest infant mortality rate, but yet we also have the highest C-section rate. And of course, hospitals are businesses, and most of the doctors are male that are choosing the C-section. And it's like all of, and then, Golfers. It's just, and golf, it, yeah, it's just, and, and if you, and, and then other things that I've learned recently about how if you're in a hospital for, if you're giving birth for a certain amount of time, then you're more likely to have a C-section just because it's, time and money and the doctors want to move on to their next thing and it's no offense to not all doctors are this way but it's true as an example one of our very good friends gave birth we had two friends give birth last week um, one medically wasn't able to do a home birth however she wanted to deliver naturally and she went to the hospital too early which they also say if you go to the hospital too early your chances of c-section increase um, because you're at the hospital longer things that not everybody knows and she was talked into a C-section, and the truth is, and they realize it now, they didn't really need one. Um, and she, she was, here she is three days into having a new baby, and she's feeling a lot of guilt. Of course, from my perspective, a baby's born, the baby's alive, that's an amazing thing, that's all that matters, and to each their own. However, I think that there's just a lack of education about home birth in general. And the fact, you know, my wife's from Sweden, so it's a, you mentioned, someone mentioned Sweden and how it's the one of the lowest infant or mother mot mortality rates. Yeah, or, yeah. or both Eternal probably. Yeah. You know, and then you have like the show like The Midwives, which is huge in England, um, but you don't ever hear about it here. So from my perspective and from our story, as a, you know, I got a chance to be there for my wife, to hold my wife in the way that she needed. She got a chance to move around our house. She was completely naked because she didn't want any clothes on her in that, and because she just, she just wanted to do her thing and she got to play the music she wanted to play. And she was in her element. Um, there was no, nothing attached to her. No one was monitoring the heartbeat and saying the heartbeat's dropping and causing her stress. And you know, she described it to me as a, you know, 
and this is something our midwife said, and it might be a little graphic, but it's like, imagine you're trying to take a crap, and there's somebody right there telling you, like, and looking at you, and, there's, and you're attached to things that are hook, hooked up to you, and they're saying, oh, hold on, wait, and oh, that, that, and there's doctors flying in and out, and people, it's like, of course you're gonna be, you know, you're not gonna be able to do it, right? <laughs> and it's an awful analogy, but it's like just, and, and as opposed to like, you know, naturally being in touch with your body. And again, not all women are candidates, which is another big thing. Like, you have to be a specific, from what I've learned, you, like, you know, there's a certain age, there's a certain body type, there's medical conditions, but there's a large percentage of women that are able, if that was of interest to them. And most of our friends, I realized, just didn't even know it was an option. Which is why, like, the fr our friends that got pregnant heard about our birth, they, you know, I talked about it on my Instagram, I became a home birth advocate in a, in a way, and then people were coming to us saying, like, is that real? Like, you, that actually happened? Like, you can do that? And then and the older generation came to us, and they were like, wait, what was that like? And then we talk about our experience, and it was amazing and spiritual. And the best part was, you know, look, my wife is, a, my wife is Wonder Woman. She, she crowned for an hour and a half. That's, inc that's, I mean, like, she was unbelievable. That's tough. It was tough. <laughs> And the midwives were just like, just cool. Just like nothing was wrong. At one point my wife's like, are you sure everything's okay? And the midwife's like, oh, you're doing so good, sweetheart. You're totally fine. And so my wife was calm the whole time. And when she, f and I got to be there and I was like, I was there. I was right there and I got to pray for my daughter as like, she, like the, as she inched her way into this world with no one around me telling me I couldn't be there on our bed playing the music, singing to her, and then she's born, and, we get, and she goes right on my wife's chest, and I get to whisper in her ear, and I get to talk to her and welcome her to the world, and everyone around us is quiet. The midwives aren't saying anything, the doulas aren't saying anything, it's me and my wife and my daughter sharing an experience that would have never been possible in a hospital. There's nothing wrong, again, again, there's nothing wrong with hospital births, but for us and for that particular experience, I wouldn't have had it any other way, and that's what we tell our friends. Yeah, my, my friend who has the husband that's the bro, basically after they had their child at home, says exactly the same. I mean, it was, he said it was transformational for him. And he was the guy that, like, would have kind of where you were, where he was like, what? It's only got to be a hospital. Yeah, because, our, you know, as a, as a man, I think one of my first instincts is I want to protect. Like, I want to protect my wife. I want to protect my daughter. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's important. Like, that's our job is we want to protect and sometimes we go too far because we you know we take over but it's it's her experience it's their experience right um yeah yeah well let me ask you oh do you want to say something go ahead if our healthcare system was set up uh, especially around perinatal care and childbirth it was set up differently and financially more people were able to have home births of of course, women and families would choose home birth a lot more frequently. And the way the healthcare system is, and the way reimbursement is, the way our insurance set up, it's just not a common, common way to give birth. Insurance in the doesn't US. cover it. No, insurance doesn't. It doesn't cover like it. you can't do a home birth. It doesn't cover it, so you have to go out of pocket. Yeah, you know, and it's five it, grand or so, and it's not cheap. You know, and a lot of people just five don't. Five grand. That, that was a pretty good midwife. <laughs> that was. Well, <laughs> that was well, I hope it was five grand. Five. five. <laughs> That's what your wife told you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it, so only a certain, so only certain people, <laughs> socioeconomic status can have it. It was five grand, by the way. Actually, it was five. <laughs> Didn't write the check. Um. Let me ask you, Justin, um, you mentioned Yelp, one of you mentioned Yelp, you mentioned Yelp has added which hospitals their C-section rates. And you're doing an app, or you're developing something, an app for women. Not for home births. No, but tell, tell is oh, it Oh, no, is it I, yeah, I built, an, I built an app for when my, when, my, uh, when my wife first got pregnant, I wanted to make a time lapse video of her belly and there wasn't really a good way to do it so I just built an app that would help women like take a photo every day or every week and oh, the March okay. of Dimes actually has yeah that. March of Dimes yeah. does ours is a little better but that's okay. 
<laughs> but I am, I am getting all my friends' footage from their home births, and eventually we're going to do a bunch of interviews, because I, I think there's a new doc that needs to happen for young, like for millennials, about home birth, because the one that Ricky Lake did, Business of Being Born, is a bit dated now. And so I think that if there were couples like my, my wife and myself and some of our other, of our other friends that are doing home births, um, I think it would give permission to a lot of people to explore the option. And that's, when I talk to my wife about it, that's all she says she wants. It's like she would have wanted to just know the information, you know, versus be told. And, and we, tell me if I'm wrong. Is it true the insurance still bills pregnancy as an illness? So it's like under the illness category? It's a medical condition. It's, a med it's like a metal, like, which blows, it's, it's, it's insane. Weren't like they the, talking about changing it to be a pre-existing condition? Yeah. Well, that's all the controversy. Yeah. I couldn't get insured when I was pregnant. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Um, Crazy. Okay, I had one last question, and now I've forgotten what it is. Um, well, uh, for any of you, what and and uh, Diana and Shadman, you guys kind of said it, so I'll start with Justin. But what what do you think storytellers can do? to change this narrative because like as you said the narrative you know when you see somebody pregnant going into labor it's always like emergency and everybody's freaking out and they're boil water or they're driving really fast or that you know it's like this big emergency thing and um deliver in the back of the taxi cab yeah, yeah there's always that you know the cab or whatever but I mean what do you think storytellers can do to kind of change the narrative on all of these topics I mean not just birth but mortality and depression and all of these things well, I think one of the coolest things about us that you know we're in a business that we have a chance to to educate right and whether whether you're on one side of the issue or the other it doesn't matter I mean I'm pro birth I'm not like pro home birth. I'm not pro any. I'm pro like women having a choice. That's really what it comes down to. And I think that there's so many people that don't know they have a choice. And we get a chance to educate people. And at least on my show, what I've learned from our writers is that you know the the greatest drama comes from life. I mean, a lot of the stuff you see on Jane the Virgin is real stuff. They just then telenovelaize it, right? <laughs> um, you know. But from we've covered abortion to to depression, to you know, um, you know, evil twins coming back. I mean, it all. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at its core, I think it would be really cool. You know, you hear about stories like men and you know not understanding or knowing, and a woman wanting something, and you can explore so many cool topics just with the idea of home birth. And you know, is it an option? Is it not? Am I scared? And all the places characters can go. At least my, that my wife and I went, and the difference between the sexes and what, in the analytical mind versus. You know, the, the this is my body and I want what I want. And, you know, there's all kinds of really cool things that you can do with it. And I think that there's a lot of material there if it can be done in a way that isn't biased. Um, that isn't saying like, oh, women, because the truth is, is that birth is birth and birth is beautiful. And you never want to make one woman feel bad because she had a C-section or she didn't or she couldn't have a home birth or she was scared because at the end of the day, she's a mom and that's the most beautiful thing on the planet. Um, but if you can at least educate the young people so they have a chance to understand because they they learn from what you guys write. I mean, they learn from what from what they see on TV and on Facebook now, which is also scary, <laughs> right? That's what their expectation is. And so these 16 and 18 and 21 year olds who are seeing these things on TV, that's what they're gonna, when they get to a certain place, like no one's reading anymore. They're just, they're watching TV and they're getting their information from media. That's really it. So the responsibility is in the room, you know? I would say definitely going to what Justin said, but taking it one step further. And I think the perfect example was, is pregnancy a condition? Is it a pre-existing condition? So to write some of that in there, wow, you know, I can't get health insurance because I'm pregnant. You know, wouldn't that be a big uh, realization to some, some viewers that you may see? The other policy issue is maternal mortality. They have it on the midwife uh, show in England. Did you know that that actually was the impetus for a maternal mortality review to be started in Texas? Because they saw the show, uh, The Midwife. So you just don't realize the power of policy also, not just educating on the healthcare issue, but policy that you could potentially have, you know, throughout all of your audiences throughout the country. Right. 
anything to add? Uh, you don't have to, but more more um, writing about uh, postpartum depression as, and and women feeling um, like they have to be happy that they have a healthy baby and their plan of having a normal, unmedicated, natural childbirth is does not matter if they at the end of it they have a healthy baby but it does matter it is a, um, a shock to the system to end up with a c-section um, mentally and physically and um, so talking about that is important um, yeah one final point i forgot to add was to really include in there the cultural differences so what does having a baby mean for a Hispanic woman versus an Asian versus a Persian versus an African-American mom? And bring those realities into light because that way we can understand, learn to understand each other. So to have that lens in there I think would be fabulous. Well, thank you. Let's give an applause to our first panel. Okay, so we went from or we're going from birth now, which and the choices involved in uh, how you want to have your baby, uh, to the choice of maybe you don't want to have a baby. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody to just close your eyes for a second. And imagine, guys, work with me here, okay? Imagine that you just found out you're pregnant. And what do you want to do? You know, you want to have the baby, or are you done having your children, or you don't want to be a parent, or, you know, and guys, you can kind of pretend and think about it. So now we're going to look at the option that you're not ready to have this baby, or you've had enough babies. Um, and we're going to talk about those choices. So everybody, you again, have your bio sheets. You know who Dr. Willie Parker is. I'm going to ask Dr. Parker to start and tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to where you are right now in your perspective around abortion. You're an OBGYN, you delivered babies for a long time. Um, you had a different point of view in the past than you do now, and tell us about that. Oh, and you can definitely have one. Hi. Uh, so I'm privileged to be here, um, and as you heard, I uh, am trained as an OBGYN. Uh, my first job out of residency was in the Central Valley of California. So I learned, I improved my Spanish uh, in the delivery rooms of Merced, California, uh, catching babies for migrant farm women uh, in a medically underserved area, and um, pivoted away to add public health to my training. <clears throat> uh, and um, Grew up in the South and uh, have as my core religious identity Christianity, and that was never problematic, not even after I chose to become an OBGYN. Uh, but when it became uh, an issue requiring me to do further values clarification, is when I became an OBGYN, like my colleagues here. Uh, I saw women with unplanned, unwanted, or wanted but lethally flawed pregnancies. And so then I had to decide what it meant to hold a Christian identity as well as be a woman's health provider if I were going to simply default to traditional Christian understanding that says that abortion uh, is immoral and that women, uh, when they <clears throat> become pregnant and they don't want to be, uh, if I have a Christian identity, uh, I'm, uh, uh, if, if I understand that in a traditional way, uh, it, it would be wrong, unethical, and immoral for me to assist a woman who asked me for that help. So for the first 12 years, I wasn't able to reconcile what it meant to uh, be a Christian and to be an OBGYN. Uh, and so I didn't provide abortion care. I never was opposed to a woman having that care, but I felt conflicted about what it would mean for me to provide that care. Um, I was able to I practiced in Merced, I went to Harvard, got an MPH, came back to California through the CDC and studied maternal mortality and sexual assault and domestic violence in the California Department of Health Services. And then I moved to Hawaii, I was on faculty at the University of Hawaii, 
and uh, was involved in a health care situation where an administrator uh, stopped us from providing abortion care for women. I wasn't providing, but I was supporting women uh, and making the decision to make sure they had access to that care. And so in a way that I had not been cornered before, uh, during my residency, I didn't get any training in abortion care. I trained in Cincinnati. The first abortion clinic, one of the first Planned Parenthoods bombed, was bombed in that city. So we weren't trained in abortion care, and I lived in communities like Merced in the Central Valley. It was largely conservative, where I, <clears throat> nobody provided care, so we would refer patients to Fresno or Modesto to the nearest place. But increasingly, it was difficult for me to continue uh, because um, the, the, it wasn't satisfying, and increasingly I felt a malaise about not uh, being clear about what my position should be. So while in Hawaii, uh, this administrator cut out uh, the, the service, and then I was brought to a crisis point around uh, an ultimate values clarification, which for me happened in the context of listening to a sermon by Dr. Martin Luther King, where his last sermon, where in addition to the whole mountaintop statement that everybody gets excited about, he also described what made the Good Samaritan good. Now, I'd been hearing the Samaritan story since Sunday school. And in substance, it was a person was mugged on side of the road. Everybody's passing that person by. The person who stops to help is known as the Samaritan. And Dr. King said that what made the Good Samaritan good was that whereas everybody passed by and wouldn't help the person, the person who stopped was able to reverse the question of concern. And, and uh, help the person. And I had my epiphany in that I identified so deeply with that story and that for the person in the story, the, uh, the, uh, the person in need was the, 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 rob, the, uh, the person who had been robbed. But I became the traveler on the road and the person in my story, the person in need were women asking me to provide this care. So I ultimately decided that it was no longer satisfying to default to traditional thinking that Christianity is mutually exclusive with being an abortion provider because the most essential part of my identity became compassion for women who, have, who need this care. And so I decided to step off of the sideline and became an abortion provider, and I've been doing that for the last 13 years. Well, so can you tell us a little bit about your practice in, you're now in the South, right, in Alabama, is it, Birmingham? Um, and what kinds of obstacles you come up against in terms of uh, providing that care? And you were telling me a little bit about it before we started. Um, so uh, after leaving Hawaii, I went to the University of Michigan, uh, did a fellowship and was medical director at Planned Parenthood for a few years. And it was at the time that I decided to become medical director at Planned Parenthood in 2009. Uh, the, the, the last day that I did full scope OBGYN practice was on the day that Dr. George Tiller was assassinated. So what was coincidental about that, I'd already made my decision to move over to Planned Parenthood because I decided that <clears throat> There were lots of people who were willing to deliver a woman's baby or to do her gynecologic care, but there weren't a lot of people willing to help a woman who needed an abortion, given that 88% of women live in a county with no abortion provider in this country, and about 30, 39 to 40% of all women, uh, the majority of the population, live in those counties. So I decided that I wanted to make myself available for women that no one else would help. And I also became aware of the epidemiology or the distri distribution of places where there were great, was greater need. And one of those places was my home region of the country, Al uh, the South, in Alabama. And so I was living in D.C. and providing care. And initially I engaged upon what I call the Harriet Tubman model of abortion care. Harriet Tubman, when she was free from slavery, she'd swoop down to the South, help a few more people get free, and then go back. So I was in D.C. I'd swoop down to the South, do a few abortions, and go back to D.C. And then I decided that I would move home and go to where the need is for a couple of reasons. One, to make myself more readily available, but two, to try and right-size the risk with regard to hopefully other people would be inspired to go to where the need is and to affect that distribution of providers so that no longer would 88% of women live in a county with no abortion provider. 
But part of that has to do with the domestic terrorism that happened. So what my practice looks like now is I've never gone into the clinic a day where there weren't people outside calling me a filthy Negro abortionist or a murderer or um, saying that I'm not authentically Christian. Uh, I've never, on I, I tweet a lot and I post on Facebook to kind of uh, create social change. I have people saying that I should be murdered, that I should be shot in the head. So there's the kind of psychoterrorism. So there's the attempt to intimidate me away from providing care. And so I don't take that personally because if I stop, that tension for it will stop towards me, but I would be abandoning women. So I understand that assaults on me directly are indirect assaults on women. Um, I um, see women uh, who have unplanned, unwanted pregnancies from all different backgrounds. If you want to know who the patients are, I see just look in the mirror. They're you. But disproportionate of those women are women of color uh, and poor women because, as my colleague said earlier, unplanned, unwanted pregnancies occur disproportionately to women who don't have access to medically accurate sex education, modern methods of contraception, uh, and health care. And so disproportionately, those are the realities of women who uh, live in the South uh, and around this country, poor women and women of color. And those are the women who bear the anxiety of our society because they bear the stigma and the shame because women who have access to private confidential services, which we can't quantify because the services are private and confidential. Um, also, they don't, they don't bear the, 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 um, the stigma of our society being uncomfortable with, with health care. So uh, women who are healthy, who are, uh, have poor health, uh, poor economic circumstances, women who are entering into a pregnancy context that makes them at greater risk for maternal mortality, um, or women who are being forced to continue pregnancies. And I can't help but wonder if we start to look at the correlation between the, the disappearance of abortion care and our rising maternal mortality that we wouldn't find a link. So uh, it's women who uh, will be disproportionately affected by uh, trying to defund Planned Parenthood or overthrow and do away with Medicaid. Those are the women that I see. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move down the line. Gretchen, you have done extensive research on how and uh, how much or how many depictions of abortion are on TV or have been, and can you tell us a little bit about your research? Yes, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm actually in the OBGYN department at UCSF uh, in San Francisco, obviously, um, part of a social science research group. So I'm a sociologist. Um, I've spent the last four, almost five years um, studying how abortion is portrayed in film and television. Um, and you all have given me quite a lot to work with. I hope you will continue to do so. Um, so we've, we've tracked depictions of abortion and reproductive decision making. So I don't just analyze stories where a character gets an abortion, but if a character is thinking about getting an abortion or talking about getting an abortion, um, we will track and analyze those two to see whether she actually does. Um, and we do this going back all the way to 1916 um, with a silent film called Where Are My Children? It's available on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> and wow. Watch it. Um, so that one, that, that's the start. That's the first one in our data set. Um, all the way through, I think, Glow is our most recent one, um, I think. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't searched this week, so maybe, maybe there's something out there that I'm already missing. This is the, the virtue of doing uh, research on popular culture. Um, so there are about about 450 depiction plot lines that we've tracked, um, and about half of them actually include an abortion. Um, and the proportion that includes an abortion has increased. Um, so it's about 50% for the whole sample. But if you look at like just 2015, 2016, um, it's about 70 to 80%. Um, so it's increasingly becoming, if you include a story that um, talks about maybe getting an abortion, um, that character is probably going to get an abortion. Um, Have you seen a change in 
like since 1916 till oh, now in few. terms of the we've quality of depictions? Yeah. Or? <laughs> uh, well, certainly. I mean, just yeah, yeah, yeah. The special effects have gotten better for the. Um, yeah, sir. So, I mean, as the obviously as the legal status, the accessibility of abortion has changed over the past 100 years. The depictions have changed wildly. Um, what I think is more interesting is to look at, um, at kind of like the last 20 years or even just the last five years in a lot of detail. Um, so in the, I think what a lot of us think of when we think about abortion stories on television um, is sort of the convenient miscarriage where I'm preg the character's pregnant, they're feeling really conflicted about the pregnancy, um, they make a decision not to have an abortion, and then they have a miscarriage, um, either the end of the episode or the next episode. Um, that was a trope that we saw in the 80s and the early 90s a lot. We, we don't see much of that anymore. Um, then sort of in the late 90s, early 2000s, we saw a lot of like the last minute mind change where you go to the clinic and you're in the waiting room and uh, you know there's a flashback or there's someone with a baby and there's like the prolonged gaze and then they change their mind, they walk out of the clinic. Um, and we know that that's not how women who get abortions make their decisions. Um, over 95% of women in the clinic feel very confident about their decision um, and, and don't have any hesitation. Um, so that, that's, that's a trope, but it, it's also something that we're seeing increasingly less of. There are a few lingering examples of that. Um, but well, just, oh sorry. Well, I was gonna say, and what about the, the characters that get, debor uh, mm -hmm. get abortions? Are they, have they changed over they the years? Have, a, a little bit, that's, yeah, that's part of the shift. So if you look at the last five years, um, we've seen a lot of really rapid change. We've seen an increase in the number of depictions that, and this is harder to determine, but probably exceeds the general increase in the amount of content that's being made. So we're seeing more. Um, we're also seeing more diverse characters, as Kate alluded to. Um, so I published an analysis in 2014, looking at 10 years of television portrayals, and something like 90% of the characters getting abortions were white. Um, and then Shonda Rhimes came along and changed that like almost single-handedly. <laughs> um, and, and so we've seen a lot more diverse portrayals. We had Isla High had uh, some Latina characters getting abortions, um, obviously Scandal. Um, Jane the Virgin, of course, uh, had a Latina character getting an abortion. So we're seeing more diverse portrayals. Um, and not just as far as race and ethnicity, but as far as a character's age as well. Um, so 90s, early 2000s, a lot of like young white high schoolers getting abortions. And that's not to say that that's unrealistic, because that's like tens of thousands of young white high schooler, young women are getting abortions every year. Um, but if that's all we see, you're leaving out a lot of stories. Um, and as Willie mentioned, um, a lot of poor women and women of color, their stories aren't being told. Um, we also are seeing more characters that are mothers who are getting abortions. Um, that's been a big shift as well. Great, okay, I'm gonna go to Sonia now because so you're manager of research at Wise Entertainment, as well as an associate producer on East Lois High. So tell us about the research that you do to prepare for the storylines that yeah. you. Yeah, it's pretty intense. And I just have to shout, I, do, I have to do a shout out really fast. I'm going off book, but my old professor is here, Dr. Gibson. No, not that she's old, but my former professor. There we go. And. I had a former classmate too, because I, I went back to school to get my MPH, where I learned all about researching these important health topics um, that we do address in East Los High. And so it's just so cool, kind of like full circle, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm just really, I feel really grateful today to, to see my and former professor. Did she give you a good grade? Because if she didn't, you she could did. say, she look did. at me now. You know? mm -hmm. I'm only giving her love, because I did get an A, but you know. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's really cool. <laughs> to be able to put those skills to use in my current job. So research is super important to what we do um, at Wise Entertainment and in the show East Los High. Because essentially we take an issue that we want to explore like abortion, which we've now um, looked at in two seasons, season one and season four. And we don't just like look at that issue. We don't just look at abortion in one episode, a one and done. It's, we, we develop an entire storyline around abortion or around whatever issue we're exploring. And we look at that storyline and we explore it for the entire season usually. So to do that in a way that feels um, meaningful, 
thoughtful, that will hopefully resonate with viewers, that'll feel really real to our viewers, it takes a lot of research from various sources. And um, we start, when we have the idea, like we'll say, okay, we're gonna look at abortion in season four. We'll start doing our research and it goes all the way through production because a lot of questions will also come up in production to make sure that we're, we're really um, addressing it in the right way. So for us, that process looks like, you know, we do literature reviews, so we do look at studies, we look at articles. Um, you call Hollywood Health and Society. We do, I'm gonna bring y'all up because you all are amazing. <laughs> Um, so we do our, our literature reviews, but we also um, conduct a lot of interviews and focus groups. So we've held a lot of focus groups with youth um, in, in East Los Angeles, because that's where our show is based. And let's say if we're looking at abortion, we will ask them about abortion and their views on it or any experiences they or someone they know may have had. But we also want to know, like, what is your life like? What do you care about? What are you passionate about? What, what is your day-to-day -day like? Because we want to look at things in a really holistic way. We want to look at the whole person. Like, you aren't just an issue to us. You are a whole person, right? So that means that we really engage with, with youth. And so we do that. And then we have our amazing partners, like Hollywood Health and Society, like the Ford Foundation, Planned Parenthood, at the national level and the local level. So we also work with like California Latinas for reproductive justice. You know, we work with a lot of folks, and they are invaluable to us. So for any show that we're doing, we have an advisory board. And I think for East Los High, we have about 20 um, organizations um, that are part of our advisory board, and these are folks that are on the ground doing the work, because we know, like, y'all know way more than we could ever know. And it is so amazing, because we can call on them. No question is too big or too, too small. We'll call them with all of our questions around any topic, like, such as abortion. Um, and they really help us answer questions. And they also, a lot of times, review our scripts as well. So they're with us the whole way from development, again, all the way through production. Even when we're getting new drafts of scripts, they will look at them, um, and, and really, they're really great at having a fast turnaround for us. So um, that's kind of our research process, and you know, we then have to disseminate that information to our writers. So we have a proprietary tool called the Story Compass, where we take all of this research and we really distill it down. Like, okay, what are the most important points? <clears throat> that we've gotten from like facts to folk stories and we um, distill it down in hopefully a really compelling way and then the writers have it as a tool to utilize for the whole season and then the writers also will call on us with their questions and um, you know we'll call on our partners like Hollywood Health and Society and they really um, y'all are amazing in terms of helping us answer questions that our writing team has and I just want to say like this isn't just a research process for East Los High because we also have a lot of shows in development. One of them being a show um, that's near and dear to my heart. And as you were speaking, I was getting a little worked up because um, I'm from the South, I'm from Atlanta, and um, the show that we're currently developing that we're doing a lot of in intense research around is looking at the reproductive rights of women of color in the South and really looking at it at the individual level, but when you start to realize a lot of the structural factors at play, it is scary to look at. I lived in Atlanta, you know, almost my whole childhood, and things that are under your nose that you don't know that is going on, and the way that women's rights are being stripped away. Um, so yeah, we've been doing a lot of intense research, just came back from a research trip, talking um, with organizations there, as well as women there, looking at not only, um, you know, the right to have an abortion, but also sex trafficking. So um, it's, it's been fascinating. It's intense, it's a lot of work, but we think it's worth it because it's the only way we feel like we can really um, do these issues justice. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, okay, Liz, how can you make a joke about abortion? <laughs> how does humor, I mean, we saw in the one clip on the BoJack Horseman, you know, how do, does it hurt or help people feel more comfortable with it and how do you do it tactfully and gracefully or do you just you just do it yeah. I mean here's the bottom line it's it's interesting because there's people that will say what humor shouldn't play a role and there's people that say humor absolutely plays a role and I mean I know that humor plays a role because I've pivoted my entire career to use humor to talk about abortion bust stigma you know, blow the hypocrisy from the politicians that want to do it, and then also bring aid and comfort to people like Willie. And so, um, 
it, what's, what I find interesting is um, if you're somebody who understands um, how much the bullshit that surrounds abortion exists, you absolutely can make a joke about it. What I don't understand are people who claim to stand in front of clinics to call abortion murder. When they make jokes about it, I'm always like, wait, I don't make jokes about Sudanese genocide. Why are you making jokes about this if you think it's real? They're, they're, they reveal their hypocrisy by using humor. We reveal the light by using humor. So, you know, I mean, you can say things and people will react. You know, the fact that when we talk about abortion, um, it's very, we talk around it a lot. You know, there wasn't the word abortion. It was like this, this was a panel where we didn't say abortion for a hot minute. You know, we, you know, people talk around it a lot. So I think the first thing we have to do is say abortion to normalize it for people that provide the care, for people who've had them. I think that um, in the stigma busting that we do around abortion, especially as we're creatives, um, you know, there is no, there shouldn't be an exception. You know, there is no good abortion, there is no bad abortion, there's just the abortion you need. And I think that we need to work from those frameworks and start by listening to the the stigma that we have just swallowed for so long that we don't even realize we're parroting as people who might be pro-choice. You know, when people say, well, no one's for abortion. I'm like, I am for abortion. I believe that abortion is good. I believe that you shouldn't feel bad about having one or talking about it. Um, and that stops people in their tracks a lot of times, right? And they're like, well, how can you be for that? And I said, because there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And if we're having that conversation, you know, where's the jumping off point? And I think one of the things that we can all use as creatives is to really analyze where is the jumping off point of the conversation around abortion? Where, where do we start from? Because I think that um, there's so many layers that we need to cover that, um, you know, if you can talk about your own abortion and infuse humor in it, I often say I chose not to have kids a couple of times. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, well, and what's your opinion on depictions around abortion and choice and other I of mean, these topics and I how we can do a better job or can we do a better job or are we doing okay? I, you know, I think just starting to have abortions on television and film more is exciting. I think you have to just start by putting it into a storyline. I think that... Um, the experiences around abortion, I think, are crucial, just like childbirth, when you were talking about race, class, and gender. Those experiences are very different for people who have them. And so really focusing on where does your character live, what is their experience, you know, who are they as a person is really important. Um, I also think that, um, you know, the abortion itself, you know, Willie has, I'm, I'm going to pivot over to Willie, because uh, Willie has a great part in his book where a first trimester abortion takes around five minutes. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that. And so to be able to have a conversation with a physician and their patient, that was a really compelling five minutes. And to have the patient say, when are we going to start the abortion? And, and the doctor being able to say, we're done. You know, to have that intimate moment around what happens, I think would be something that would be really enlightening. I think there's just you know, that gauntlet. I think fake pregnancy centers that are out there in droves have really exploring what the avenues are, not just of just like, I peed on a stick and I'm pregnant. Sometimes a lot of things go into when you go on the internet and if you type in, um, I'm pregnant and don't know what to do, you don't get a clinic that's gonna help you for the first thing that comes up. You get a fake clinic that's been designed by the right um, that gets you in the door, that hides their message, and you can be shamed. So I think following the path is really important. I've talked to a lot of abortion providers, and then I'll stop. Um, I've visited and, and done work with like 100 different providers, and often what they say to me is, when a, when a young person finds out they're pregnant, a lot of times from the time they find out they're pregnant till the time they get to that doctor, no one has been nice to them or kind to them in that journey until they get to that person. And so I think really realizing that those things are real um, 
could be just added value to when we talk about the abortion experience because quite frankly, as somebody who's had two abortions, having an abortion is not is very anticlimactic. When you have one and you're there, I'm not talking about the emotional, everyone has their emotional range, but the actual physical act, but the build up to it because we don't talk about it scares the shit out of people. The fact that we call it a surgical abortion when there is no surgery is problematic, you know? So, yeah. There's a, there, I well, think. And on going on that, um, in East Los High, in the first season, you had one of the characters find out she's pregnant and she's contemplating an abortion and she's talking to her friend and she says, oh, but if I get an abortion, I'll never be able to go to church again. And she has this whole sort of religious conflict about it. And then the character that we saw in season four is like, this is my decision. This doesn't have anything to do with the father. This is what I want. And she's very emphatic about it. So did you get any feedback from viewers on the religion piece? Or, you know, because in the Latino community, of course, religion can be a very important, powerful thing. So. Yeah, for sure. We have, um, we call them ELH addicts. We have very active fans that let us know what they think in real time on social media. It's amazing. Um, but no, we did that on purpose. So we wanted to, again, a topic like abortion or any of the issues we address, they're complex. And so we wanted to show, and everybody experiences them in different ways. And like you said, there's a, there's a wide uh, emotional range uh, and everyone is different. So that's why in season one, we had a character super Catholic, super conflicted. And she had a long contemplation process and she was going back and forth. And, but she finally, she did get an abortion um, in season one and she was ended up being very happy with her decision. So we showed that. And in season four, we were like, you know what? Because what we found, again, working with our partners, um, I believe it was one in three, the one in three campaign, which the stat is by the age of 35, one in three women will have an abortion. So why, oh, before 45, thank you, thank you, my bad, my bad, thank you. So again, why is there so much stigma around it? And what they told us is that, um, they told us that um, a lot of women actually say that they feel a great amount of relief and that's not often portrayed in television and film and media. And so we wanted to portray that. And so with Camila, um, the character y'all saw in the clip, um, in season four, she just knows right away. She's like, this isn't some big discussion for me. I, I, she still, obviously she had her emotions around it, but she was very clear. And she was very clear, this is my body, this is what I'm gonna do. And she accessed resources. And that's another thing, we always try to integrate um, resources into the show. So it's a 360 experience. So there's the main show, and then there's also transmedia pieces. And then there's also on our website, resources and links to real clinics where women can get um, resources. So um, yeah, I wanted to show all of that. Right. Did you, you look like you were about to, wanted to say something. Oh, no, I was just thinking that uh, Liz was exploring the notion of what it means to be pro-choice uh, and, uh, or pro-abortion. Pro-abortion, yeah. And uh, I think there's this expectation that for some people, as an abortion provider, because I uh, am not, I don't, uh, accommodate the politics of respectability and turn it into a tragic narrative that every woman is a victim who's having an abortion or for them I'm not contemplative enough because I find joy in my work and they conflate my being excited about my work about what I do with the fact that what I do is help women and so when I say that I'm pro uh, abortion I'm pro-abortion the way a cardiothoracic surgeon is pro-heart transplant. <laughs> they don't want somebody to need a heart transplant, but if a heart transplant is necessary, they should be able to get one and there should be a, no limitations. So for me, I, I'm not, it, <clears throat> how many abortions? As many as is necessary. So people want me to say, oh, I never want to see a woman again. I want to see a woman every time she needs an abortion. and. What we should be working for is not zero abortions, we should be working towards uh, an irreducible minimum. Given that pregnancies go awry, given that circumstances get crazy, and given that there are times when abortion for that particular person is the best situation, 
the irreducible minimum says, I never want a woman to need an abortion who can't get one. Great. Okay. I'm going to invite our previous panel. You guys stay where you are. I'm going to have uh, Diana and Shadman and Justin come join us up here. We have some extra chairs. Why, when we think of religious institutions, we think of them being anti-choice. And I'm wondering when that conversation shifted and um, being a little bit more in the secular community, I guess I'm not so aware of, are there large you know, religious movements that are in support of pro-choice and how do we encourage that for our friends of faith? Sure, it, 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 the, it was actually 1967 and it was the clergy consultation service and this year they celebrate the 50th anniversary because the pastor of, of Judson Memorial Church in, uh, in, the, in the village uh, uh, formed the clergy consultation service. And they intentionally, they were aware, they did the epidemiology and they were aware that in New York City there was a very high maternal mortality rate and most of the women who died were black and brown and poor because at that time abortion was illegal but women of means, mostly white women and women who were insured, were able to go petition their doctors to get a, uh, an ethics waiver in the hospital. So women of means were able to get permission to have an illegal abortion safely in the hospital, whereas poor women who were black and brown were dying in the streets. Uh, the clergy thought this was immoral, and they formed the Clergy Consultation Service, and they strategically took out a full-page ad in the New York Times because at that time the penalty for aiding and abetting an abortion was a thousand dollar fine and a year in jail. So by doing it publicly they averted that risk, but they also set the stage to demand accountability from the New York state government. And so three years later in 1970 the first uh, law uh, legalizing abortion was passed in New York followed by California and Hawaii. And so the reason that we now think that abortion uh, is primarily immoral based on church opposition is that there's a very ahistoric narrative around how we ended up getting legal abortion in the first place. It was concerned clergy who made the moral argument for the safety of abortion and who sought to resolve the disparity between poor women and women of color. Uh, it was like if, 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 if women of means can be, get safe abortion, everybody should get it. And so that's how abortion became legal. Uh, at the petition of clergy making the moral argument. Fast forward to 1980, that narrative gets hijacked by the uh, moral majority and the uh, very, uh, uh, the, the, the relationship between the Republican Party and the moral majority that is fruited into uh, the notion that there is, that abortion is immoral versus a health issue. So it shifted from e uh, epidemiology and health to uh, a moral argument for conservative politics. And so we now bear the brunt of that uh, uh, stigmatizing women. However, there's a move in, this, in the uh, space of the 50-year anniversary. The Religious Coalition, which was an offshoot of the, of the Clergy Consultation Service, on whose board I sit, is trying to make an effort to re-engage clergy to make the moral argument for um, abortion services to combat this very narrow uh, religious position that uh, has been conflated with the political positions of the party that is in power. Other I questions? Also, can I, sorry, can I just step in on that a little bit? Which is, I, I think that sort of the omission of that narrative is also part of a larger misunderstanding and misrepresentation of, of illegal abortion provision pre-Roe. Um, and we see that a lot on TV. So pre-Roe narratives make up about a quarter of the abortion stories that we see on television, and they're almost uniformly extremely dangerous abortions, which isn't necessarily unrealistic, but there were many safe providers. And so what we see are these dangerous abortions and dangerous abortions and dangerous abortions. And while the contributing story there might be, look, illegal abortion is dangerous, what it means is that a lot of abortions on TV are quite, quite dangerous. Um, and I think that, that part of that is, is a demonization of the provider. We see very, very few narratives of moral, safe providers because we see so many 
dangerous, illegal providers. So there, there are no, well, that's not true. There are very few doctors um, like Dr. Parker on TV. There is Addison Montgomery, but she's not on anymore. So, um, <laughs> you know, so, so we, we've, we've seen very, uh, the, the range of, of providers has been really, really narrow from what we've seen depicted. Um, and I think part of that is that a historical knowledge of what provision used to look like. Right. Over there. Thanks. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Sisson. Um, hi, Gretchen. So um, I read in one of your articles that you talked about in Scandals the first time that they'd actually shown like the arm moving of like during an abortion and to something that to like actually show like the provider, not the fetal arm, the <laughs> provider's arm providing the actual abortion. Um, they did do that on American Horror Story. Yes, an American Horror Story as well. But that was a really scary depiction. Um, but you know, Liz talked about the situation that could be depicted of you know the provider talking to the patient at that moment and like what the actual provision of abortion looks like because the provision is often shown as so dangerous. Um, what are some other things that you would like to see kind of demystified or um, demographics that you'd like to see kind of on film and TV in the future? Yeah, so, um, so Renee, so Scandal was the first show to show the actual abortion happening without cutting away, and it did it twice in 2015, um, except for House did it once in like 2010, but it was in like open abdominal surgery inexplicably, um, it, which was interesting. I mean, how, House is crazy, right? These crazy cases, and maybe that was necessary. I don't know, it's not real. Um, but <laughs> but Sc Scandal did it, did it twice. Um, it, but it's and it's a, it's great that they're showing that on screen. But then it was also at like an ambulatory surgical center, right? And and um, she's got the hairnet on, and, and she's ha essentially having surgery. So so like the, none of these portrayals are going to be perfect, and and one portrayal is not going to check every box. So I think what it is is sort of just continuing to diversify the stories that we see, and that part of that will be with increasingly diverse characters um, with a wider range of reasons for getting the abortion, um, different types of stories we're seeing. And I, I think Liz can take some credit for this. Li between Liz and Jenny Slate, or um, Jillian Rose here with Obvious Child, like we're seeing a lot more comedies that are including that. Um, between Maud, then there was like a 30 year break bet until Sarah Silverman talked about abortion. And then there was another five year break. And then in 2016, we had four comedies that included abortion on network television. And it's, it's just this sudden shift in, in not just the characters that are getting abortion and what we're actually including in those stories, but like what these stories are really about. And I just want to add too, um, you know, being somebody who my background is political satire and um, and, you know, I created The Daily Show, and then going to watch how shows like John Oliver and Sam B, you know, we did we left, they're not narrative shows, but they're shows that are breaking down a lot of the barriers and a lot of the facts so that people can get really good information about what's happening. <clears throat> I think watching for that, too, um, is really important because those shows can really do that justice in a way where they can name names, say things, show the political aspect around it so that the narrative dramas can really um, coexist in a really good way with that as well. Another question, anybody? Um, hi, uh, okay. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the health insurance piece because um, I, I was pregnant in 2000 10 um, and my husband's work situation shifted and I wasn't running TV then and uh, I was pregnant and he lost his care and then I lost my care and then I couldn't get insured um, and so I was calling insurance companies and I actually got told by Kaiser that they would pay for an abortion but they wouldn't cover my pregnancy um, wow. so it, it, like getting covered was insane and I just was curious like in your experiences it, it feels like health care but, you know, part of it is just like, how do you even get access to it? Um, and how, you know, how are, you know, Dr. Parker, like how are the women that you're seeing, you know, paying for their care? How do they get insurance? Is that a stable thing or is that a shifting thing in their lives that they cope with? Um, and then for other people in terms of like, you know, anybody that you interact with, like how are they even getting access to the care that they get and how, secure do they feel in that care? Because I just 
I'll never forget like how incredibly insecure I felt and how like my first appointment that I after I got insurance I was convinced it like was going to get taken away like I thought they were going to take my card and be like oh yeah no just kidding you know you don't have it anymore well uh, at abortion um, might be a little bit different given that there's targeted le uh, uh, legislation or at least a rider, a funding rider that's attached to every national budget called the Hyde Amendment that prohibits uh, women who rely on public uh, funding, like here Medi-Cal or Medicaid nationally, from using that money, that coverage to cover abortion care. Now individual, because uh, <clears throat> Uh, Medi the Medicaid program is a matching program. It has two components, state and federal funding. The federal part can't be used, but states can elect to cover abortion from the state portion of funds, and that may be 14 states that do that. But none of those 17. states- 17. 17, thanks Liz. <laughs> but none of those states are in the South, okay, or at least in the Southeast region uh, where I practice. So what that means is that for each woman, it is an out-of-pocket expense to end the pregnancy. Uh, and so that means that women are often trying to decide between paying their rent, uh, they miss days of work, arranging childcare, arranging transportation. So the average cost of an abortion is about $550. So someone living in abject poverty, for example, in Mississippi, the overall poverty rate is right about 20%. Uh, uh, the national poverty rate is 16, the poverty rate for black people is 42 percent most of those people are women and children and so you have higher rates of abortion for women of color and poor women that means people with less are having to use a larger portion of their coverage if you look also in the expansion of uh of, with the affordable care act there were prohibits prohibitions around people who had expanded access they were uh they prohibited the uh the funds that uh, uh in the exchange programs from covering abortion as well. So the working poor or the people who had expanded access also were still in the same boat around making abortion coverage being uh, an out-of-pocket cash expense. And, and, I would just, and I would just like to add too to that is for um, a lot of the clinics that do a full range of care, like let's say you didn't have insurance and you wanted to get coverage, um, by having Medicaid um, not be available or if it's available in small amounts in those places or if you provide abortion and comprehensive care you they won't allow you to use Medicaid what happens is with the independent clinics especially the Medicaid reimbursement is so so small that the clinics are subsidizing the actual care and then the way that Medicaid pays out um, it can be it can be 12 months so the clinics are always on the edge of closing because of the amount of, they have to take out bridge loans a lot of times just to stay open. And so when you look at like where were you to go to carry your pregnancy um, and a clinic that would provide comprehensive care for women can't get Medicaid or Medi-Cal that if you might have qualified for that because they provide abortion, it's just goddamn ridiculous. I'm just five seconds because Renee would kill me if I don't say. Okay. They're part of the other filling in the gap is there is an organization called the National Network of Abortion Funds. Renee works for them uh, in terms of they coordinate the efforts of lo state and local abortion funds to try and fill the gap. They don't pay the full cost, but they do what they can to offset the cost. Uh, they also administer an abortion fund that I started uh, that funds abortion specifically for women in Alabama and Mississippi. So part of the gap is uh, organic and Valve a lot used to head the one in DC. But there's an effort to have a grassroots local effort to f offset the cost with uh, charitable funding, but for the most part it's out of pocket expense. And let me just, I know Justin, you said that the doula and having a home birth was not covered at all by insurance, right? Oh, you have to share, sorry. Um, and Shadman, maybe you wanna, uh, both of you wanna talk a little bit about the coverage piece and maybe Dr. Ramos as well in terms of, we've learned about coverage around abortion but coverage around pregnancy and and then the C-section piece and what Lisa Ling was talking about where cha-ching, 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 you know, the money piece. So I don't know if either of you wanna comment on on the insurance piece or the coverage or the cost? 
Yeah, if you don't have uh, private insurance through through work, it's uh, very difficult to cover pregnancy and and prenatal care and all the labs and at least one ultrasound. It's a lot of money. You have to sort of have ten thousand or more, or sometimes more, laying around to pay for all this uh, expense and and. You then, then if you don't have private insurance and are not independently wealthy or just regular work and regular um, income, then you have to figure out: Do I make too much to be able to get medical to cover my pregnancy? The income level for pregnancy care and childbirth it's higher so you can make higher and still be able to to um, be able to get medical but then your choices are decreased you won't be able to um, have well, you um, you won't have a home birth someone has to pay a lot of uh, give you a big gift of money <laughs> to be able to do that um, and and there are not that many uh, clinics that accept uh, medical there are some community clinics that you can go to to, uh, to get uh, prenatal care. There are certain hospitals you go that will be able to care for you to give, to, and, and give birth. There are many midwives in the country. Majority of midwives in the U.S. work in underserved community clinics. Um, so uh, because, because nurse midwives are mid-level practitioners, um, the, it, it is it is a lot more financially um, uh, sustainable to to have uh, nurse midwives attend births in hospitals, um, but it is very difficult. I had someone call me a few weeks ago. I don't want to go into too details, of course, but um, they lost their insurance nine months after um, the birth of their child. And it well, it's devastating because now um, they don't have uh, the, the, the lost work and hence lost uh, health insurance, and it's very difficult to care for um, all the necessary um, postpartum care that uh, that this woman needs. Um, and it actually that that first year after you give birth. It, you're, uh, all women are pretty h at high risk of developing postpartum depression, and this one thing that has this big change in their in their life triggered this woman's uh, postpartum depression. And of course, now she has no resources. There are no, I mean, um, a, a maternal um, an MFT uh, or a psychologist or a psychiatrist they charge three hundred dollars per session. Um, I'm going to give the password to Dr. Ramos, and then we're going to adjourn, and you can ask them all your other questions out there while people are eating and drinking. So, so, so one reality, in the United States and in California, 50% of all the births are paid for by Medicaid, so they're government paid. 40% uh, are paid by employer, and the rest are cash in a variety of, of either one of those. The one thing, though, that I really want all of you to realize is that just because you have health insurance does not mean you have access to health care, does not mean you have access to quality health care either. Because, um, again, going back to the statistics as to the C-section rate in California, depending upon what hospital it is that you are delivering in, and oftentimes, those are the highest uh, Medicaid hospitals. Those are the ones that have the highest C-section rate. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and in California, we're, we're trying to change that in that um, Medi-Cal is actually going to change the reimbursement uh, for those hospitals who are not working to decrease their C-section rate by 2019. They are not going to be paid for, for the C-section delivery. So again, going back to policy, going back to what's going to really drive the change, I think Cal that's why California, I believe, is leading the way to improving some of the health outcomes. Okay, let's give the, our panel a round of applause.